In the midst of our Life in the Spirit series, um, we are at the part that is called the gifting activity of the Holy Spirit. And um, there were just a few chapters in the Life in the Spirit book uh, on the spiritual gifts and uh, was looking at this to go a little bit deeper than what uh, Dr. Robertson McQuilkin went in his book. And uh, I have a, a Bible study guide um, called He Gave Gifts by Charles Swindoll, uh, longtime uh, pastor and teacher, uh, Insight for Living uh, Radio Ministry. And uh, Chuck Swindoll, as he writes this, he gave gifts. Uh, I'm just going to read a little bit from to introdu uh, introduce here the study tonight on gifts that grab our attention. Swindoll writes, think how you would feel if this happened to you. You have a friend who lives in a city many, many miles away, and because of this great distance, you haven't been able to see each other for years. Every Christmas, though, you try to make up for that distance by taking great care and effort and choosing just the right gift. Even the details of the wrapping reflect your love and respect for your friend as you select elegant paper and colorful, ex exquisite bows. Then one day out of the blue, someone sends you enough money to make a long dreamed of visit to your friend. Bubbling with anticipation, you travel the many miles, finally reveling in your friend's warm welcome. Talking and laughing like two giddy kids, you share a wonderful ride from the airport until at last you've arrived at your friend's home. After a few moments, you pause to survey the living room, but see none of your gifts on display. While still chatting, you glance into the den, the kitchen, the hallway, no gifts. Your heart begins to sink, but you don't have the courage to ask about the gifts. While your friend is away on an errand, however, you peek into the front closet and your heart drops. There, after all these years, are all the once glittery gifts you sent, still wrapped and unused. How would you feel? As you think through your own emotions, perhaps you can imagine a little of how God feels. For he has sent us beautifully wrapped and carefully selected gifts as tender expressions of his love for us. Yet many of us have stored these gifts in a closet, unopened, unused. As a result, we may be missing the special way in which God wants to use us through our gifts. And there are gifts of grace. We don't earn them, but he gives them to us in order for the service. On your outline, first of all, a brief review of the gifts, what they are. They are abilities or skills given to each Christian, enabling us to function in particular capacities with ease and effectiveness for the glory of God. That's a definition given by Swindoll, and he gave gifts. In, in your Bibles, if you turn to the book of Romans, chapter 12, the Apostle Paul is talking uh, in 1 Corinthians 12, we see about the body, the illustration, but we see that same idea of many members in one body that Paul writes about in Romans chapter 12. And our focus will be reading verses 3 through 8. Paul says, For through the grace given to me, I say to everyone among you, not to think more highly of himself than he ought to think, but to think so as to have sound judgment as God has allotted to each a measure of faith. For just as we have many members in one body, and all the members do not have the same function, so we who are many are one body in Christ, and individually members one of another. Since we have gifts that differ according to the grace given to us, each of us is to exercise them accordingly. If prophecy according to the proportion of his faith, if service in his serving, or he who teaches in his teaching, or he who exhorts in his exhortation, he who gives 
with liberality, he who leads with diligence, he who shows mercy with cheerfulness. So one body and different members of that one body, but not all of the members function the same. There's different functions. There are different gifts, God's design. So we think about why these gifts are important. First of all, they keep the body balanced. We don't all have the same function. We're different members of the one body. And as believers use the gift that the Lord, that the Holy Spirit distributes as he wills to each believer, as that believer uses that gift, it encourages the body. It encourages, it edifies the church. So they keep the church healthy. And they keep the focus clear. Now Paul makes a big point here. He says, don't think of yourself, you know, don't, don't think so highly <laughs> or don't have an exaggerated view. Now in Corinth, that was a problem, wasn't it? There were those that said, oh, look at me, I have this gift. And, and they were exalting a, a certain gift above the others. And Paul says, huh. -uh. You have to remember the Holy Spirit distributes as he wills. You haven't, quote, earned this gift. It's God's grace. It's unearned. But God gives. And so we're going to be looking more specifically over the next several weeks over the gifts themselves. Tonight we're looking at a simple way to categorize the gifts. There are three main categories for the gifts that are listed. There are 28 or 29 listed in, the, in various passages. The first would be called the support gifts, and that's the first group that we'll deal with. We'll start tonight, and then uh, we'll go on uh, looking at support gifts. The support gifts are foundational, like the heart and lungs. They're vital to the body of Christ because they provide direction and leadership for the church. And then the next uh, category of gifts, the service gifts. It's interesting because in 1 Peter chapter 4, verses 10 and 11, we're told the two divisions, there are speaking gifts and there are serving gifts. And uh, the serving gifts typically have, uh, they're working behind the scenes, quietly encouraging and building up the body, but they're crucial. They're crucial. The ones that the serving gifts they're, they're, you know, somebody that is out in front, they can't say, we don't need you, <laughs> to the one that is working behind the scenes. No, the body is needed, the, the, all the members and the people using their gifts, and it edifies the Lord, but it edifies the church, building it up. There are sign gifts, and the sign gifts are, we could say, the most controversial Whenever you deal with uh, teaching on spiritual gifts, I, uh, I pastored a church on Wednesday night on, uh, for Bible study. We had about four or five churches represented. We, we had several that said, our church don't have Wednesday night service. And so they, they started coming to the church I was pastoring. And, and we had this uh, a classroom that was pretty full on Wednesday night, and, and we had different groups, I mean, different backgrounds. Uh, we had backgrounds that were way different than Baptist, and, and this was a, a Baptist church, but it was different than, than Baptist, and so I'm thinking, oh boy, <laughs> when I got to 1 Corinthians 12 through 14, I was a little nervous how this was going to go in the midst of teaching uh, on the spiritual gifts because we had charismatics in the class. We had, uh, uh, you know, we, we had all sorts of, of different uh, uh, wonderful believers. And so I just lovingly taught 
through the scriptures and, and brought this out. And so the sign gifts, I think an important way to handle the sign gifts, just as a way of introduction to sign gifts, would be go to 2 Corinthians chapter 12 and what the Apostle Paul says. And the reason they could have the name sign gifts is what Paul says in 2 Corinthians 12 and verse 12. The signs of a true apostle were performed among you with all perseverance by signs and wonders and miracles. Now, what did he say they were signs of? They were signs of a true apostle. Now, Paul's addressing this because there were those false teachers. They were claiming to be false apostles. They were false apostles claiming to be under this authority. And Paul said, the signs of a true apostle were performed among you with all perseverance by signs and wonders and miracles. And you can also go to the book of Hebrews, chapter 2, in verses 1 through 4. The Bible says, for this reason, we must pay much closer attention to what we have heard so that we do not drift away from it. For if the word spoken through angels proved unalterable and every transgression and disobedience received a just penalty, how will we escape if we neglect so great a salvation? After it was at the first spoken through the Lord, it was confirmed to us by those who heard. God also testifying with them, both by signs and wonders and by various miracles and by gifts of the Holy Spirit according to his own will. So as Hebrews says, there's the indication of the sign gifts and we'll be getting into those uh, much later as we go through um, these series. The sign gifts supernaturally manifest the Holy Spirit's power, authenticating God's presence in the church. These gifts could never be mistaken for someone's natural abilities. They couldn't be mistaken for natural abilities. Well, let's begin work on a general understanding of the support gifts. In 1 Corinthians chapter 12 and verse 28, the Apostle Paul writes in 1 Corinthians 12, 28, and God has appointed in the church first apostles. You, you could also... Uh, Turn over in your Bibles to the book of Ephesians, chapter 4. I believe in Ephesians 4, when the Bible says that, that Christ ascended and he gave gifts to men, I think literally you could say he, he was saying gifted men. And it says in verse 11 of Ephesians 4, he gave some apostles as has been added. It's italicized. So you could read, he gave some apostles. The apostles were those who had seen the risen Jesus Christ, had seen the risen Lord. Remember when on the, in the upper room, when Peter was talking about that Judas Iscariot, you know, had, had left and, and Judas had betrayed the Lord and all that, that, that took place. Remember what happened? when uh, Judas Iscariot had, had left, and Peter says, uh, uh, we need to have another one take his office. What was the requirement? Who, who was going to be eligible to be an apostle? They had to be an eyewitness of the Lord Jesus Christ. And there were two men that were put forward and we know uh, Matthias was, was selected they, as they cast lots and, and with how Matthias was, accept, you know, was numbered among the apostles. So the apostles, those that had seen the risen Jesus, 
were appointed by him as foundational leaders to teach doctrine to the church. Remember in the book of Acts, whose doctrine was it that they would go? It says they would take heed to the apostles' doctrine, the teaching. Now it's interesting because in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, with the list of gifts, we see for to one is given the word of wisdom through the Spirit. Uh, Chuck Swindoll writes, endued with great wisdom, they devoted themselves to founding churches, writing scripture, and forging out the tenets of the faith. Perhaps their wisdom resulted from the gift word of wisdom, which closely parallels the gift of apostleship. The wisdom and what the apostles were doing. Remember that the apostles and prophets were called the foundation of the church in Ephesians 2.20. Who is the chief cornerstone? Jesus. Built upon Jesus. But you see the foundation of the church was called the apostles and prophets. What did they have in common? Both apostles and prophets received direct revelation from God. They received the direct revelation from Almighty God and they were transmitting that to the early believers. But because what did the apostles and prophets not have that we have tonight? They couldn't get together and say, turn in your Bibles to 1 Corinthians, uh, 1 Corinthians or turn in your Bibles to the book of Ephesians or the book of Romans. They didn't have the completed scriptures. So they were receiving direct revelation from Almighty God. So that's the idea of the apostleship. In Ephesians 4, when it says that, that Christ gave to the church, he, he gave apostles. That was the first in the order. Apostles would go in, and the, the word means to sent forth. They were sent forth, and they would preach Jesus Christ. They would be sharing the gospel. And the signs of the apostles, and the fact God enabled them, empowered them to do miraculous signs to, to authenticate the message that they're giving. And, and we see that in the scriptures. So the first group would be the apostles. But then the Bible says in 1 Corinthians 12 and 28, God has appointed in the church first apostles, second prophets. Apostles were sent forth, but the prophets spoke forth. When we think about the prophets, I always heard it described and it helped me to think with the pro with a long line of prophets would be they were foretelling, F-O-R-T-E-L-L-I-N-G. They were speaking for Almighty God. Foretelling. You have for, F-O-R-E, telling, which was the idea of predictive prophecy, was the idea of, of saying this is what's going to come. This was the predictive prophecy. And then you had strong preaching in light of forth telling that would say this Thus says the, the Lord. This, this is the word of the Lord. Sometimes when, still to this day, when you hear strong preaching, you'll hear, them, you'll hear somebody be referred to as a prophet of the Lord uh, on the aspect of strong preaching of the word of God. And in, in Romans chapter 12 and verse 6, it talked about prophecy in proportion to his faith. The second, uh, this statement on, uh, under the notes of prophets, 
Swindoll writes about this, apostles had the gift of word of wisdom, while prophets had the gift of word of knowledge. The two gifts, prophecy and word of knowledge, were probably in action together when Peter supernaturally knew about Ananias and Sapphira's secret withholding of money from the church. You can turn to the book of Acts, the fifth chapter. Remember a man named Ananias with his wife, Sapphira, sold a piece of property? That's fine. They sold the property. It was in their control at that time. They sold a piece of property, and they kept back some of the price for himself with his wife's full knowledge and bringing a portion of it. He laid it at the apostles' feet, pretending like he brought all of it. He was lying. And, and, and she joined in on this. They had sold the piece of property and they tried to say, oh, we sold it for this much. They sold it for way more. But they kept a part of that, but they pretended like they were bringing it all uh, there in Acts chapter 5. And the Bible says, he laid it at the apostles' feet, but Peter said, Ananias, why has Satan filled your heart to lie to the Holy Spirit and to keep back some of the price of the land. While it remained unsold, did it not remain your own? And after it was sold, was it not under your control? Why is it that you have conceived this deed in your heart? You have not lied to men, but to God. And as he heard these words, Ananias fell down and breathed his last, and great fear came over all who heard of it. The young men got up and covered him up, and after carrying him out, they buried him. Now there elapsed an interval of about three hours, and his wife came in, not knowing what had happened, and Peter responded to her, tell me whether you sold the land for such and such a price. And she said, yes, that was the price. Then Peter said to her, why is it that you have agreed together to put the spirit of the Lord to the test? Behold, the feet of those who have buried your husband are at the door, and they will carry you out as well. And immediately she fell at his feet and breathed her last, and the young men came in and found her dead. They carried her out and buried her beside her husband. Now notice verse 11. I can imagine this. And great fear came over the whole church and over all who heard of these things. Here's Ananias and Sapphira devising this plan. They lied to the Holy Spirit, and they, they do this. But how did Peter know all about it? You know, that, this was the answer. Peter had the complete knowledge of what was going on, didn't he? He knew. And you think about how this is, this is going together. We have many examples. Remember Agabus that, that told Paul, uh, that he was going, what he was going to suffer going into uh, to Rome and, and all the things that was going to happen. And uh, remember he took the, he said the owner of this belt and he, he, he bound himself and all these things. And what about, uh, and, and we know that women had uh, the gift of prophecy that were prophets because you have um, Philip, uh, you have the daughters of Philip that were prophetess. They, they were prophesying. And so you have all sorts of examples in the scripture. So the prophets were speaking forth this message. This amazing spiritual gift was highly valued because the New Testament had not been completed and the early church needed to know God's word. So as a result of their insights, revelations, and visions, the prophets warned, reproved, and encourage the people. Uh, the spiritual gift of prophecy in the light of foretelling or, or the predictive prophecy was limited to those who voiced God's direct revelation or practice no longer necessary. Why? Because we had the completed scriptures. Sometimes you'll hear people you know, claiming to have a word from the Lord but it doesn't line up and, and this is what we always you know what? We need to test it, don't we? 
when they'll say, hey, I, you know, does that line up with the scriptures? Does it line up with what is already in the word of God? Because we're told in 1 John 4 to test the spirits to see if they are be of God or not. Because there's a lot of things out there today that are not of God, that are under the realm of Christian teaching. And, uh, you know, it, there's, a, there's too many isms and all sorts of teaching to, to ke keep up with all. I can't keep up with all of it. I'll be honest with you. I can't keep up with all the, there's all sorts of new uh, fangled teachings and all sorts of things coming always down the chute. And you listen to this and say, what's happening? And I have to tell you, somebody can say it's under Baptist realm and you can't just say, hey, okay, it's safe. I mean, here's the reality. We have to test it. We have to know what does the Word of God say and, and what is, you know, what's going on. And when it doesn't sound right. You ever hear something and there's just a check in your spirit that says, you know, this, this doesn't line up. You reject it. It doesn't line up with Scripture. It does not line up. And this is a key aspect. And when we're faithful to know the Word of God, this is why it's so important. That's why Paul, uh, Paul praised the Bereans. You know why? They checked it out to see whether these things were so or not. They, they were, to be called a Berean is, <laughs> that's a good thing. That uh, somebody that's checking it out. And they said, you know what? We, we want to get in and, and find out ourselves. Is this so? Is this line up? And we must do that. We must do that. We must. One of the reasons, to be honest with you, one of the reasons I give out the outlines Sunday morning or Sunday night or even Wednesday night, it, is, it serves a couple reasons. Uh, number one, to try to keep me on track. But number two, to encourage you to take that and to dig, dig in further. Check it out. There's some, you know, it might be an area that says, hey, I want to study this more. My desire on, on the times I'm teaching is to encourage you to go, go deeper, go farther. Taking it and say, hey, I'll check this passage out, or hey, this passage comes to mind. And, and that's the whole desire. That, that's why, uh, one of the reasons the outlines, it's, it's to encourage you to take it and go farther and keep studying. And, um, and I'm always, uh, anytime that there's questions or anytime there's a way I could help you, just let me know. If I don't know the answer, I'll do my best to find it out. And so what happens is to, to encourage you in the scriptures as you continue on. As we, in the future weeks, will look, we saw in Ephesians 4, it says there were apostles, then prophets, and then it says evangelist. Evangelist would go into an area, and um, evangelists usually wouldn't stay in an area that long. They would go and preach Christ and reach people for the Lord Jesus Christ. They would go on to the next city or they'd go on to the next area to continue to evangelize. And then who would be there to continue to help those new believers in that church and the, to bring them along? And they gave, and I really believe it's pastor and deed teachers. It, in our Bible, say pastor and teachers, but it can be uh, pastor and deed teachers to teach God's word, to help people to grow in Christ, to help them in the scriptures and teaching God's word to see them have spiritual growth. And so uh, the design with the church. But Paul said it all starts being built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, those who were receiving the direct revelation from Almighty God, but Jesus Christ as the cornerstone. This was called gifts that grab our attention because we see this, first of all, with the apostles and the prophets. 
and, and how they were seen in the book of Acts, you can follow that through. And then you see uh, evangelists and then pastors, teachers, and then we'll keep going with the support gifts and then how they're used, and especially um, uh, teachers teaching God's Word and how important that is. Let's close the word of prayer. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for your sovereign work in the church. Lord, the use of apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, indeed teachers, for the purpose of equipping of the saints for the work of ministry, the building up, the strengthening in the faith. Lord, we pray that as we go through the spiritual gifts and look more and see these categories, that it may encourage us as we seek to, to find out and, and discern what our gifts would be as the Spirit distributes. And, and Lord, you have given us passions. You have given us a, a passion for certain areas. And we thank you, Lord, how you use us and our availability. And when we seek you, Lord, to say, show me, I want to just be used of you for your glory and honor. We thank you for each one. We continue to pray for those that couldn't be with us, Lord. And we pray as we go out. You've told us in 2 Corinthians 5, and even as Paul told Timothy, he said, do the work of an evangelist. You have given us, each one of us, the ministry of reconciliation. We are ambassadors for you, Lord. And you have given us the word of reconciliation, the glorious gospel message. Lord, as you give us those opportunities, may we follow you and we love you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.